Hello, thank you for watching this lecture presentation for my final project in NR5021. Today we'll be discussing maximum likelihood estimation. To start out, I will give a brief overview of what maximum likelihood estimation is and what its goals are, as well as include a little bit of history and the various applications of the method. I will then provide you with some of the basic principles of maximum likelihood estimation, including defining the likelihood function and using the method in different types of distributions. After establishing the basics of maximum likelihood estimation, I will then give an example of how maximum likelihood estimation can be applied within a phylogenetic analysis. Once finished, I hope you will come away with a more complete understanding of this method, as well as a deeper appreciation of its application in a variety of professions. So let's get started. So what exactly is maximum likelihood estimation? As I established in my lightning talk presentation, maximum likelihood estimation, or for shorthand, MLE, is a method of estimating the parameters of a model given observations of a data set. The goal of this method is to find the parameter values and maximize the likelihood of making those observations given the parameters. I will go over this again a bit later, relying on the coin flip example I used in class during my Lightning Talk presentation. Just a little bit of uh, history for you in regards to MLE. It was first introduced and made popular by Ronald Fisher, a famous 20th century statistician between 1912 and 1922. That is him pictured in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Notice that it took more than just one year to develop and publish this method. That is because it was composed of three justifications that took on three different names, and at one point it even existed in two different forms. Finally, in 1922, Fisher summarized the entire process into one method, the maximum likelihood. Following 1922, MLE was further popularized and used in a diverse array of fields throughout the 20th century and on into the 21st century. Some of these fields include agriculture, economics, and even phylogenetics. So let's discuss a bit the principles of this method. As with many statistical analyses, we will start with observations that are contained in that data set. For MLE, these observations are both independent from one another and identically distributed. Think of each observation as x1, x2, x3, and so on until you get to x sub n, uh, which is however many observations you have in a data set. Now, the distribution of the data will have an unknown probability density function. We covered this at the beginning of the semester, but recall that the probability density function is a function of the density of a continuous random variable. Also recall that continuous variables are non-discrete measurements, such as uh, the measurement of the diameter of a tree, uh, and thus, in theory, it can have uh, infinite values. We can characterize this using the function of f sub zero x f sub zero x is also a part of a family of distributions that are known as a parametric model. These distributions can be defined by a set number of parameters with our parameters being represented by theta. Now that we have theta, our probability density function can now be represented as the function of our data x given our parameter or parameter values theta. The next step to take is to define the likelihood function. To do this, we need to specify the probability density function for all of our observations. We did this previously by establishing our function as our randomly sampled observations given our parameter theta. To establish the likelihood function, we will just need to establish a function of our parameter theta given our observed values x of n. We will then denote this function with an L and call it the likelihood. In other terms, this function will be the likelihood of our parameter given the data that we have observed. Since each of our observations is independent from one another, we could also write the function as the product of each of the univariate probability density functions. In this case, our function will be a function of x with the value of theta of the constant. So now that we understand the likelihood function, we can now apply it to the maximum likelihood estimation method. This can also be referred to as a maximum likelihood estimator, and it is a value that will maximize our parameter theta. In other words, it is the value of theta that will maximize the likelihood of obtaining the data that we have observed. The maximum likelihood estimation can be applied to a wide range of distributions, such as normal distribution, binomial, or Poisson. During my lightning talk, I briefly covered an example of a binomial distribution using a coin flipping example. If you recall, I provided some data in which we toss a coin 10 times with 7 of those tosses landing heads. We considered x equals 7 to be heads, and that served as our observation value. We then searched for the parameter value that would provide us with the maximum likelihood of achieving the outcome of our data. This is a fairly straightforward example of using the method of maximum likelihood estimation. Given that I only had about three minutes to cover the topic, I wanted to keep things fairly straightforward. 
I'm sure you were left wondering things like, how can this be applied to other fields of study besides coin flipping? Well, wonder no further, because for the remainder of this discussion, I will go over an example of how the MLA method is applied in a field that I am interested in, that is the field of phylogenetics. As with any other statistical analysis, we will start with some data. In this case, our data will be in alignment of genetic sequences. If you are not as familiar with the field of genetics, hopefully you will recall from watching Jurassic Park or from a genetics class in the past that the letters A, C, G, and T all represent nucleotide bases, those bases respectively being adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. These nucleotide bases align in specific sequences in an organism's DNA to create proteins which essentially allow our bodies to function properly. In phylogenetics, specific and conserved DNA sequences can be used to generate hypotheses of relationships among genes, species, or an entire group of taxa. Our data here are four genetic sequences of the ENC1 gene, which codes the ectoderm neural cortex protein 1. This gene is a common gene used in phylogenetic studies involving fish. The sequences provided here are real and were obtained from the National Center for Biotechnology Information website. The fish that these ENC1 sequences belong to are Endomia tetradactylus, Alticus arnoldorum, Alticus saliens, and Praealticus margaritarius. These fish are all comb-toothed blunnies, the group of fishes that I am studying for my masters here at the U. Alticus arnoldorum, Alticus saliens, and Endomia tetradactylus are all air-breathing fishes that live the entirety of their adult lives out of the water in a superlatorial zone, or the area of the ocean where land is constantly splashed but never submerged by waves. Pictured here is Alticus arnoldorum, the Pacific Leaping Blunny, named so because of the leaping movement it uses to navigate its terrestrial environment. So we have our four aligned genetic sequences for our data. Now we need a probabilistic model. In this situation, our model will be a hypothesis about how one ancestral sequence has evolved into the four genetic sequences that are present in our current alignment. Keep in mind, the goal of doing MLE on this alignment is to find the highest likelihood of the ancestral ENC1 gene sequence for our four selected species. Our model will also need a set of parameters, which will be the tree topology, or more simply, the shape of our tree, the branch lengths of our tree, which represents the amount of evolutionary change over time, the nucleotide frequencies represented by pi as the nucleotide diversity of each respective nucleotide, again, either being adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine, and the nucleotide-nucleotide substitution rates, or the probability of a nucleotide being substituted by different, or in some cases the same, nucleotide. So now that we have our data, our model, and our parameters, we can get started. We'll start out by first calculating the probability of one individual column in the alignment. In other words, how do we calculate the likelihood of the column in the alignment? Let's first look at our alignment. Again, these are real alignments of the ENC1 gene taken for our four fish species of interest. However, this is not the entire ENC1 gene, as the real sequence is several hundred base pairs long. For this example, I have selected only 10 base pairs. However, again, these are real sections of the sequence, and the section that I have highlighted demonstrates that P. margaritarius has a substitution that differs from the other three species in our alignment. So let's say that we randomly select our parameter values for tree shape, branch lengths, nucleotide frequencies, and a randomly selected nucleotide-nucleotide substitution rate matrix. Our tree shape will be the unrooted tree that you see to the right of the slide, with each tip of the branch randomly arranged. The branch lengths will be T1, T2, T3, T4, and T5. Nucleotide frequencies will be represented by either pi A, pi C, pi G, or pi T. And the nucleotide nucleotide substitution rates will be represented by probabilities or substitutions generated by our substitution rate matrix. Let's start on the tree where the big red arrow is and ask ourselves what the probability of having a C, a cytosine, is here on our branch. So the probability of having a C here is the same as the frequency of pi C. What then would be the probability of having a C here and then on the other end of the branch an A? or an adenine. This would be the probability of having a C at the end of the branch, pi C, times the probability of the C being substituted for an A, times the branch length T1. Continuing, we will multiply the probability of A being substituted for C, times the branch length T2, then the probability of A being substituted for A, times the branch length T3, 
probability of A substituting for C tends to range like T4. And then the probability of A being substituted for becoming T times 5. All of this can be written in our column likelihood equation, which is here at the bottom of the slide. That is how you calculate the likelihood of one column in a sequence alignment. Let's now take it a step further and compute the probability of an entire genetic sequence alignment. One thing that I will point out here is that the nucleotides in red on this slide represent the ancestral, ancestral state nucleotides. In phylogenetic terms, this means they were the nucleotides present at our highlighted site of interest in the evolutionary ancestors of our four current species. I arbitrarily selected A and A to be the ancestral states for our tree. Since we are calculating the likelihood of the nucleotide sequence for the ancestral state of our tree, we will need to calculate the likelihood of all possible combinations of ancestral nucleotides. For our tree, we have two internal nodes and the 16 different combinations of ancestral nucleotides. For each of the 16 possible combinations, we will need to redo the probability calculation from the previous slide. Each of these 16 probability calculations will then be summed to provide the overall likelihood of that column in our alignment. We can then do the same for each column in the remaining portion of our alignment. So we have a randomly selected tree with randomly selected parameters in which we do not know what the ancestral nucleotides are. Therefore, for each combination of ancestral nucleotides, we need to calculate the likelihood of, what, of that combination occurring. Once all 16 combinations have likelihoods calculated, we will then sum up the likelihood, thus giving us the maximum likelihood estimation for that individual column alignment. Calculating the likelihood for each separate column as we did on the previous two slides will give us the likelihood required to find the likelihood of the entire sequence alignment. In order to do this, we will also need to assume that every position in the sequence evolves independently, and the way we combine independent probabilities is by multiplying them. Hence, the overall probability of our entire alignment is found by multiplying the likelihoods for each column. In statistical terms, the product of the likelihood for each column. One extra note is that calculations as large as these are frequently done on the computer. Since entire genetic sequences are often several hundred base pairs long and probabilities are small numbers ranging from 0 to 1, these calculations can yield extremely small values that computers often struggle to compute. This is known as an underflow error. In order to combat this, phylogeny software will often compute the sum of the log likelihoods instead of multiplying the product of the likelihoods. This is basically just taking a natural log of the equation and taking the sum of those log likelihoods. So, since most of these calculations are extremely large and require a computer program to calculate, what better program to use in the example than a computer program R and a package in R known as Fangorn? The Fangorn package was released very recently in November of 2017, and it is a package that can be used to calculate the maximum likelihood estimation for phylogenetic sequence data. Using a package such as Fangorn, we can run a maximum likelihood estimation on a sequence alignment fairly easily. All you need is your data in the form of a sequence alignment, as well as your model parameters consisting of nucleotide frequencies, nucleotide substitution rates, tree shape, and branch lengths. To start, you set random initial values for all of your parameters, as was shown previously when we were calculating by hand. Then, let R compute the likelihood. Once it's computed the likelihood, R will then slightly adjust the parameters in either direction so that the likelihood will improve. This method of switching parameters around will occur until a maximum is found. The maximum may be a local optimum in that it might not be guaranteed to be a global optimum. However, if the simulation is ran several times and R starts each simulation in a random place with its different parameter values and you still end up with the same consistent maximum, then it's likely your maximum is a global maximum for your data. The maximum likelihood estimate results that R will provide you will yield you an estimate of how well the model, or hypothesis, fits the data. This is your maximum likelihood. It will also give you the MLE of tree shape, branch links, and the MLE of nucleotide frequencies and substitution rates. So to conclude, I have shown you the maximum likelihood estimation is a method to provide an estimation of the parameters of a model given the data that you have. The goal of maximum likelihood estimation is to find the parameter values that will maximize the likelihood of making your observations given the data that you have. In a phylogenetics context, MLE can be used to compute the maximum likelihood of obtaining a given sequence alignment of multiple genes, species, or taxa, with the outcome or goal of the method being to provide a phylogenetic tree hypothesis of the evolutionary ancestry of that set of genes, species, or taxa. I hope you enjoyed learning about this method and its applications. Thank you for listening.